Hi, I'm David Gain. Uh, this is one of my talks, my talk on evolution. Um, much more fun when I do it live, obviously, but I'm uh, going to try and do a, a recording on Zoom so I can put it onto the internet. Uh, so here we go. I am going to start by sharing my screen and set that up so I can play a video in a minute. So you should now be able to see uh, my main, uh, my initial slide, evolution and natural selection. So this is Charles Darwin. Uh, about 150 years ago, he produced a book called uh, On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. Uh, he was, he delayed publication for quite a few years. Uh, he was concerned about the response from the religious establishment. Uh, he was a Catholic. His wife was a devout Catholic. Uh, and sure enough, when uh, the book was published, um, he took a certain amount of stick. He never actually said that uh, we were descended from apes, but the implication was there. And so cartoons like this were popping up. When I do this talk live, uh, I put a sheet of paper on a table near the entrance so, as, so people can see it as they come in with this question on it. And I'm going to give you the answer to that question later on. And here's my agenda. Uh, so I need to start off by saying what evolution is and what natural selection is. Uh, then I'm going to take a look at the uh, rocks beneath our feet and look at this uh, information we can get from those, the tales they tell. And then in section three, uh, which I called Earth Story, I'm going to tell the story of life on Earth from the formation of the Earth up to the present day. Once I've done that, uh, I've got two more sections there on other aspects of evidence for evolution. So why Robinson Crusoe didn't eat beef and a section called We Discovered the Secret of Life. And at the end, instead of questions, obviously, as I've got no audience, um, I'll just give you an opportunity to feedback um, and uh, references as to where I've got some of my information. So here we go. So what is evolution then? Uh, well, this is a definition uh, of it. Uh, life on Earth evolved gradually, uh, beginning with one primitive species that lived more than three and a half billion years ago. And it branched off over time, throwing off many new and diverse species via mutations in DNA. That species word is a little bit slippery, especially when you start talking about bacteria and the like. Um, but if you think of a species as a group of individuals that can interbreed, um, then that, that's good enough for most purposes. And the implication of all that is that the species that are around today weren't around in the past. They're descended from others that lived earlier. Um, so um, we are not descended from monkeys. We and monkeys are descended from something else that went before. And it takes many generations to make a substantial evolutionary change. We can be talking hundreds, thousands, even millions. And evolution is not a fixed speed thing. It can slow down, it can speed up, uh, depending on the, whether the environment is stable or whether it's changing, environmental pressures. So natural selection then, what is that? That's the mechanism for most evolutionary change. Uh, so individuals of a single species have different characteristics. Uh, so in human beings, tall, short, fast, slow, um, blue eyed, brown eyed, lactose tolerant, lactose intolerant, all sorts of differences and different characteristics uh, give the individual different chances of survival in a particular environment. So I'll give you a couple of examples of that, uh, things uh, that uh, provide more chance of survival. Uh, so if you think of the ice ages uh, when they started to hit uh, and the mammoths were out there, uh, the woollier ones would have survived the cold slightly better and had a, a greater tendency to survive and reproduce and pass their genes on to future generations. So as the generations go by, uh, the mammoths would get woollier and woollier as the less woolly ones um, died out. Antibiotic resistance. So. Uh, half a century ago, we introduced antibiotics for the first time and blitzed the bacterial uh, population. Uh, but amongst that uh, population, there were a few bugs um, that, for some reason, some genetic aspect of them made them better able 
to resist those antibiotics and survive them. And as all the others got killed off and these ones continued to breed, uh, over the hundreds, thousands, millions possibly of uh, uh, bacterial generations since in that 50 years, um, they have become more common and uh, more prevalent. And so we've started to see antibiotic biotic resistance. Uh, you might have a characteristic that gives you less chance of survival or even no chance of survival. Uh, so, for example, if um, a newly conceived embryo has uh, a change, a mutation that causes a change in form or in presence of a, of a protein, a body chemical. Um, so hemoglobin, for example, that carries the oxygen around in our blood. Uh, if that forms differently or incorrectly, then the embryo wouldn't even survive. And that does actually happen. Uh, some conceptions fail in the first few days of pregnancy and the woman doesn't even know that she's uh, she's conceived. And then there are other mutations that might make no chance, no difference to your chance of survival unless circumstances change. Um, so this lady is a member of the uh, Visya Indian caste. Um, and surgeons for some time have found that uh, when they use muscle relaxants on the Visya, uh, during operations, um, they have prolonged muscle paralysis and they have big problems with that. Um, and when DNA analysis made it possible to look into it, uh, they discovered that a single mutation in one of the, the Visia thousands of years ago has spread gradually through the population, uh, but made no difference to them until modern anaesthetics came along. So that's evolution and natural selection. Let's take a look at the rocks beneath our feet. So this is Ostcliff. Uh, if you've ever had occasion to use the old Seven Bridge, and as you leave England, you look over your shoulder to your right, you'll see these cliffs there. And I like that picture because it shows very clearly how the rocks have been laid down in layers, one above the other, um, and the youngest at the top and the older ones beneath. And if you imagine that happening, uh, so on this illustration, the blue rocks are the oldest, uh, the yellow slightly younger, green younger again, and the red youngest of all, the gray represents the sky. And these rocks have been lifted up and bent. So we've got hills and valleys there. And now you can imagine uh, rain and weather getting to work on that and wearing that terrain flat. So you end up with this. And if you remember, imagine that guy walking from left to right, you can see uh, he's walking on rocks of different ages. Initially, he's on the oldest rocks, goes on to the youngest, then on to the oldest again. And then on the extreme right hand side, you can get just a glimpse of those younger rocks. And if you imagine looking at that from above, uh, you would see that the rocks appeared in strips. And if you look at a geological map of the area I come from, uh, down on the south coast here in Portsmouth, you can see exactly that in the rocks beneath our feet. Um, the rocks there aren't those colours, of course, those represent the different kinds of rock. We identify the different kinds of rock by the different kinds of fossils that we see within them. And if you look broader, further afield, you can see uh, the same trends and the shapes where things have been lifted and distorted and bent and weathered. Uh, you can see different rocks in different parts of the country. So if we're relying on fossils then to tell these things apart, how are those fossils formed? How does uh, something that's just died uh, become a fossil? Well, first of all, it needs to be buried fast, otherwise it's going to decay or get eaten. Uh, and that's likely to happen underwater, uh, in the seas, the lakes, the rivers, the floodplains. Um, so trilobites, for example, that used to scuttle around on the seabed hundreds of millions of years ago. Fossils of those are quite common. Um, T-Rexes, land-based, not so much. And it has been estimated that about 1% uh, of creatures are fossilised. And that's not 1% of the individuals, that's 1% of the species. So for every species that we find fossilised, there could be another 99, perhaps very similar, um, that haven't been fossilized at all or which we haven't found yet. And when we look at those and we put the rocks, study the rocks and put them into layers, and geologists have done this uh, over hundreds of years, uh, in the youngest rocks, uh, we find the more recent creatures like ourselves, the humans, the mammals, the mammoths and so on. 
And as we go further and further back in time, we see, see earlier forms. And right back in the early days there on the left hand side in the oldest rocks, you can see the fishes and the corals. So studying the rocks beneath our feet and the layers that they're in uh, can give us relative differences, relative ages, but it doesn't tell us how old those rocks actually are. So here I've got a little video that explains that. Uh, it's a scientific American thing. It's just a couple of minutes long. So I'll flip across to that and just play that for you. How do we know how old something is? For people, we'd ask to see their birth certificate. For trees, we'd count the rings. But how do we know how old a fossil is? Fossils have their own internal clock. Scientists can read it by looking at the ratio of two different types of carbon atoms. Of course, every living thing is made of carbon. Plants grab carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and use it to form complex organic molecules. Animals get their carbon by eating these plants. But there's more than one form of carbon. Most carbon atoms have six protons and six neutrons. We call this carbon-12. High up in the atmosphere, sometimes cosmic rays hit nitrogen atoms. This creates carbon with six protons and eight neutrons. We call this carbon-14. Carbon-12 and carbon-14 behave alike, but carbon-14 has one unique and important attribute. It's unstable. So once an animal dies, the carbon-14 in its body will start to go away. Every 5,730 years on average, about half of the carbon-14 atoms will decay into nitrogen. This is its half-life. After one half-life, the animal will have about half the amount of carbon-14 it started with. After another half-life, it will have about a quarter. And after another half-life, it will have about an eighth. By contrast, the amount of carbon-12 it has in its body will stay the same. By measuring the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12, we can measure how many thousands of years have passed since the animal died. Carbon dating works for fossils up to about 60,000 years old. For older fossils, scientists use unstable elements that have much longer half-lives. For Scientific American's Instant Egghead, I'm Michael Moyer. So that's how we tell the ages. The next video is a homemade one, so it's not up to those professional standards. It's something I've put together myself. Um, but before we get into the life story, the history of the Earth, I wanted to talk a bit about those millions, how big a million actually is. And so I prepared this video in uh, the area where I live, and I'm going to run this through. This is just a couple of minutes as well. So I'm outside the Crown in Emsworth, and I'm here to talk about big numbers, millions. We're going to be talking about millions of individuals, millions of people. And I just wanted to stop and have a little think about that. Well, sadly, I don't have a million coins, but here are ten. You'll have to imagine the rest. And as you can see, I'm starting my line of coins by the crown. So, I'm going to take a walk towards heaven, and I want you to imagine that line of coins extending along beside me. And we're going to see how far we have to go before we reach the millionth coin. Our minds haven't really evolved for dealing in millions. There was no survival advantage to that. Uh, if you close your eyes, you can picture four, six, maybe ten items, but a thousand, a million? That's why we had to invent numbers and arithmetic to cope with that. Don't forget that line of coins extending along beside me. Still got some way to go. And here's the last of our million coins. Where have we ended up? Outside the wheelwrights in heaven. 
about 25 minutes walk and that's just a single million So millions, when we're talking about millions, those are enormous, enormous numbers. So the next part of my talk I've called Earth Story. And it starts here. And this is 4,500 million years ago. And I'm going to tell the story of uh, the Earth's history uh, as though it was a single day. So here's a 24 hour clock, if you like. Uh, we're at the first midnight. You can see the little arrow there on the bottom left hand side. Halfway across that is noon. So that would be halfway through the life of the Earth. And at the extreme right hand side is current day. But this is where we start. And it's probably not going to be one of your favourite holiday destinations. Uh, we think the surface may have been molten. The atmosphere included hydrogen sulfide, which is bad egg gas, and methane, uh, which you get uh, you have in your gas cookers, and something like 20 times the current rate of carbon dioxide, so big, big greenhouse effect. And more importantly, perhaps from our perspective, no oxygen, no oxygen for us to breathe. So here's a question for you. When on that 24 hour clock, do you think the first simple single celled life appeared? Was it in the first quarter of the Earth's history between midnight and 6 p.m.? Second quarter, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. to noon, third quarter, noon to 6 p.m. or the last quarter, 6 p.m. to midnight? Don't know what you think about that. I've given this talk live quite a few times now, and I've kept a record of results. I've actually asked this question of 500 people uh, to date, and this is the way they've answered. So these are their guesses. I don't know where you fit on that. You can see there's a majority for uh, life appearing quite late. Actually, almost half of them have gone for the last quarter of the life history, 6 p.m. to midnight. The correct answer is actually the first quarter. So if you went for that, well done. The first life appeared on our 24 hour clock, sort of three, four, five o'clock in the morning. And these were simple single celled uh, creatures called prokaryotes. Uh, that comes from the Greek, pro means before, and carry means a nut or, or a kernel. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, we're talking about a nucleus. And I've taken the trouble to explain that um, for reasons you'll see in a minute. We think, as far as we can tell at the moment, we think these things uh, may first have come about underwater, uh, where you get um, two tectonic plates coming together and volcanic activity uh, on the surface of the sea and lots and lots of heat and lots and lots of chemicals. We think they may have started there. And later on, we're going to meet the eukaryotes, the true nucleus. Uh, so these are single cell creatures that actually have a nucleus that holds the DNA. And we'll come across them later. OK, so first quarter, then that's when the first life appears relatively quickly. So when do you think the first multicellular life appeared? So these are still bacteria, but the multicellular, but small things. Um, and uh, the single cell life appeared sort of three, four, five in the morning. So when do you think they appeared? Was it uh, before noon? Was it in the afternoon there between noon and six or was it 6 p.m. to midnight? See what you think about that. This is what uh, previous audiences have gone for. They've more or less split between those first two options. So let's find out. Here's our first life. And there was basically only one ma major innovation in the next billion years, five and a half hours or so uh, on our clock. And that was photosynthesis. So these little microscopic things, uh, cyanobacteria, these learned the trick of photosynthesis sometime between sort of 8.30 and 11.15 in the morning on our 24 hour clock. And photosynthesis is the process that's used by plants and other organisms like these to convert light energy into chemical energy. And that can then be stored and released later to fuel uh, the organism's activities. 
And that process supplies all of the organic compounds and most of the energy necessary for macroscopic life like ourselves on Earth. And there's a waste product, oxygen. Over billions of years, these little bacteria are largely responsible for producing and maintaining the oxygen content of the Earth's atmosphere. So I mentioned eukaryotes. Uh, these are still single celled creatures, but these have a nucleus, a true nucleus. And these pop up at about 20 past one in the afternoon on our 24 hour clock. So we're into the afternoon now. And they have a much more complex internal structure than the prokaryotes. Um, they have little things inside them, almost like our own organs. Um, there's a separate nucleus um, that now holds the DNA. And there are things called mitochondria. Um, there can be tens or hundreds of thousands of these in a single eukaryote. And these are like little batteries or little power packs. So these eukaryotes have potentially access to a lot more energy than the prokaryotes that went before. And as a result, um, they're much, much larger, 10,000 to 100,000 times larger than the prokaryotes. Um, still can be microscopic. And if you've come across stromatolites, uh, these are in Shark Bay in Australia. These are the remnants of some of those early eukaryotes. Uh, it's not the creatures themselves, the creatures, the bacteria as they lived, produced waste products. And it's those waste products um, beneath it that have built these up over um, generations, thousands of years, millions of years, um, to produce these remains that we see today. And with the eukaryotes, uh, we have the possibility now of multicellular life. So this is life where cells can perform different functions, brain cells, muscle cells, and so on. Um, but don't hold your breath, we're some way to go yet. Early multicellular life, uh, so all higher forms of life, plants and animals, are eukaryotes and they can be multicellular and they don't first appear until about 10 past seven in the evening on our 24 hour clock. So now cells can begin to specialize. As I said, you can have gut cells, you can have muscle cells, um, you can have brain cells and so on. Different cells in the body can perform different functions. And going back to our answers, you see the, I don't know which one you went for, um, but the correct answer there was between 6 p.m. and midnight. Uh, only a minority of the people I've asked in the past have actually got that. So now we've got that one out of the way. There's the dinosaurs. Everybody loves dinosaurs. So when do you think the first dinosaurs appeared? Was it before 10 p.m.? Between 10 and 11? Or was it after 11? And remember that first multicellular life appeared about 10 past 7 at night. I don't know which option you've gone for there. This is the answers that people in the past have gone for. Um, so a big majority there going for after 11 p.m. in the last hour. And before we get to them, uh, we have something called the Cambrian explosion, about five past nine at night. And this, in, in terms of the history of the Earth, is a mere tell million years. It's almost, almost uh, the blink of an eye in geological terms. But in that period, we find almost all the body light layouts that we see today appearing. We see the first predators, we see the first skeletons, uh, and nearly all the earlier uh, non-skeletal, mushy uh, fauna die out. So by 20 past nine at night on our clock, uh, we see uh, all the forms, uh, most of the forms that we see today. We see the trilobites, scuttling about on the seabed. Uh, we see corals. Uh, the third picture there is a brachiopod. So that's uh, an early clam, if you like. And on the right hand side, we have an artist's impression of an early cephalopod. And the cephalopods are the things that became later on the octopuses, uh, octopi and the squids. So now the pace starts to pick up a bit. 9.30 at night, um, the plants begin to colonize the land. And by quarter to 10, land plants are well established. They're changing the landscape. They're creating new habitats. And at five to 10, we see the first fossilized trees. By five past 10, four-limbed vertebrates, creatures with a backbone like ourselves, move onto the land um, and seed plants and large forests start to appear. And we call this period the Carboniferous because those trees, as they fell and rotted, 
um, were preserved as coal, and most of our coal comes from Carboniferous rocks. And then we get the sauropsids, the dinosaurs, and we look in there at about quarter to 11. So coming up to last orders uh, in the pub, this is the first site we see of the dinosaurs. And at the same time, we see the beginnings of the mammals. The mammals are small, they're nocturnal, they're warm blooded. So coming back to our question, when did the first dinosaurs appear? Uh, they appeared between 10 and 11 at night uh, on our 24 hour clock. And about a quarter of the people I've asked in the past have managed to guess that correctly. So next question then, when did the first modern humans begin appear? So those first dinosaurs are appearing at about quarter to 11. Um, do you think the first modern humans appeared before 11, between 11 and 11.45 or between 11.45 and midnight? So take your guess on that. These are the answers that um, previous people have gone for. So the majority went for 11.45 to midnight. So our sauropsids have popped up at to about quarter to 11, which uh, become the dinosaurs. Uh, birds, about 10 to 11 at night. So birds are actually evolved from dinosaurs. Birds are living dinosaurs, they've survived. And about 20 past 11, about chucking out the time in the pub, um, we get the earliest flowers. So no flowers on the earth before this point, no grasses uh, before 20 to 12. And then at just about 20 to 12, we get the Chicxulub asteroid impact. And this is what wipes out the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. So the asteroid that hit, uh, hit uh, just off the coast of Mexico. Um, it was seven and a half miles wide. It hit at about 45,000 miles an hour and there was a 120 mile crater. And we can still see the devastation that must have caused if you look at we had to take readings of gravitational anomalies in that area. You can still see the rings and the damage where that thing hit. And just to give you a perspective on that, a 120 mile crater, if that thing had hit London, um, then Haven, Newbury, Cambridge, Canterbury, Hastings, all of these places would have been within the crater. And of course, the crater wasn't the end of it. There would have been tidal waves beyond anything we can imagine. Uh, there would have been fires, um, sulfur dioxide blasted into the atmosphere because as luck would have it, the, the rocks in that area had a lot of sulfur in them. And of course, debris, lots of debris, lots of soot. And so there was global cooling. Uh, the sulfur dioxide uh, turned into sulfuric acid and Fairless acid rain. And then that was followed by a period of global warming. Um, and we think this was caused by massive, massive um, volcanic eruptions uh, in a place called the Deccan Flats, uh, way beyond the scale of anything we see today. And that may even have been triggered by the impact of the uh, asteroid, we're not sure. So the dinosaurs are gone. Six minutes to midnight, uh, we see the gibbons. Five minutes to midnight, the orangutans. Three minutes to midnight, the gorillas. And at two minutes to midnight, our own human line splits from our nearest cousins, the chimps and the bonobos, and soon after that, start to walk on two legs. So if any of you have ever heard of Lucy, famous fossil discovered in Africa, um, she dates back to about 11.58 and 45 seconds. Uh, this is the beginning of the ice ages. Many of the large mammals get wiped out. And then at three seconds to midnight, 130,000 years ago, the first anatomically modern humans evolve. So that's the answer to our final quiz question. Um, three seconds to midnight. And you'll remember I mentioned at the start, uh, I put this out when I do this talk live uh, for people to think about what important evolutionary event happened in three seconds on our 24 hour clock. We did. Three seconds to midnight. So simple single celled life popping up relatively early in the morning multicellular life not till after seven the dinosaurs pretty much at last orders and ourselves right at the end there at three seconds to midnight 
130,000 years, three seconds on our 24 hour clock. So here's another perspective. Let's come at that from the other angle. Uh, so this is me uh, and William Collis, my great, 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 great grandfather, buried just down the road, uh, just outside of Chichester. He dates back 300 years to the early 1700s, and that's seven generations. Those first modern humans, about 130,000 years ago, we're talking about at least 5,000 generations. So 5,000 generations of human beings in that three seconds on our 24 hour clock. So moving on, uh, I said I'd uh, talk about a couple of other things that support the idea of this theory of evolution. And section four, I've called why Robinson Crusoe didn't eat beef. And this is biogeography. Uh, Charles Darwin was big on this. He thought this pretty much proved the case on its own. It's a big subject. I can only give you one example, and that's oceanic islands. And oceanic islands are islands that have never been in contact with the mainland. So they're coral islands, they're volcanic islands that have appeared in the middle of the ocean, never been in touch with the mainland. I don't know if you've heard of Alexander Selkirk. Uh, he was the inspiration for the Robinson Crusoe stories. Uh, and he was marooned on an island called Juan Fernandez Island off the coast of Chile. And the island used for the Robinson Crusoe story is a little bit closer to Santiago there on the map you see on the left. And while Alexander was cast, uh, cast away there, uh, he found plants, he found birds, he found insects, he found spiders, but he didn't find any land mammals. There were no reptiles, no amphibians, there were no freshwater fish, and even trees, with one exception, even trees were rare. The plants, the birds, the insects, the spiders, had evolved and changed to fill the niches that on the mainland are occupied by missing ones. So why don't those missing species appear? Because they've got no way of getting there. They evolved on the mainland. Birds can get there. They fly, obviously. Uh, they lay eggs. There could be seeds in their droppings, parasites in their feathers, bugs on the mud on their feet. Plants, of course bird dropping some feathers, seeds floating potentially by sea, ferns, fungi, mosses, spores carried by the wind, and insects, spiders and plants potentially could get there uh, on rafts of vegetation uh, carried on the surface of the ocean. Trees? What's the tree that you think of when you think of a desert island? Coconut palms and the nuts float. So my final section is called We Discovered the Secret of Life, and this is about DNA. So I don't know if you were around on the 28th of February 1953 or what you were doing then, um, but if you were on that day in this pub in Cambridge, a couple of guys walked in and said, we've discovered the secret of life. Watson and Crick had discovered the structure of DNA. And we've all seen this, the double helix, the famous double helix. And the key to this, um, the way that it works, is the rungs on the ladder. Each rung is made of two chemicals, uh, they're called bases, uh, and there are two ways that you can get them to fit together. So adenine and thymine, pink and blue, can form a rung you know, with either one on the left-hand side, and cytosine and guanine, the same, they can form a rung. So that DNA can split, the rungs can split and separate. And then if the bases are floating around, if the chemicals are floating around, each one only attaches to it, mate. So you end up with a copy of the original. And that's how DNA splits and reproduces. And that copying procedure includes lots of mechanisms to detect and to fix errors. It's fantastically accurate, but you do get errors. And those errors are mutations. So since Robson and Crick, we've learned a lot since 53. Uh, human DNA has 3.2 billion rungs. If you unwound the DNA in a single cell, it would be taller than I am. It would be over two metres. And all of that fits into a nucleus of a, an individual cell in our bodies that's just six thousandths of a millimetre across. 
DNA, we've discovered, uh, is used as, uh, as an instruction manual for creating chemicals called amino acids. And those amino acids then are put together in different sequences to form the proteins that make up our bodies. And there are only 20 amino acids that we've discovered in all the living things we've studied. Um, but in humans, those amino acids go together to form over 20,000 different proteins. And a weird thing about DNA is that 99% of it is what we call non-coding. It doesn't actually produce amino acids and proteins at all. In the early days, we used to call this junk DNA. We're starting to think now that it does actually have some influence uh, on the way we develop, um, but it doesn't actually create the proteins. So mutations then. Are you a mutant? You'll recognize these guys. The average human has about 60 mutations. 60 differences in their DNA that neither of their parents had. So all of us actually are mutants. But when you think about it, 60 mutations, that's just one for every 200 million rungs of DNA. So fantastically accurate copying, but there are errors. So how does DNA mutate then? What are these copying errors? Well, one thing could be, uh, one way it could do it is like uh, uh, in the old, an old fashioned record with a scratch on it. And the same bit plays over and over again. So you get a chunk of DNA that's copied and produced in the new version more, time, more than once. And this can happen a lot. Um, so you can end up with a thousand different uh, copies of a particular chunk. And each of those copies then can mutate in different ways. So in the mouse, we have uh, a thousand different, slightly different scent genes, all based on the original single one that detect uh, different smells. So a mouse has an incredible sense of smell. You might get point notations, a single run on the ladder. And cystic fibrosis is caused by a point mutation at a single point. Uh, and of course, you might have genes that stop functioning. They mutate and stop functioning. Um, so in mice, there are a thousand scent genes. In humans, there are 800, but 400 of them don't work. Why not? Uh, because we don't rely on scent in the same way that the mice do. We have full color vision. We can tell whether food is ripe or not. We can detect shades of grain. So our sense of smell isn't nearly as important and we can survive mutations uh, in these scent genes uh, without too much harm and without changing our chances of survival. The other thing that DNA can do is we can compare the DNA between two different species. And if our theory of evolution is right, then the more similar they are, the more closely related those two species should be. And this is a very complicated area, very statistical and mathematical. Um, but when we do that, we find that it matches, broadly matches the conclusions from the fossil record. And where it doesn't, we go back and look and we find either that we've made a mistake in our maths or that we've, there's been a mistake in the interpretation of the fossil record. So the two marry up. So that was my final section. Uh, if you'd like to provide me with any feedback, I'll give you my website address. You can contact me through that. I'll give you that in a moment. Uh, if you liked, liked uh, the talk, that's great. Uh, even better if you've got some suggestions, um, that would be brilliant, Con constructive suggestions, love those, or other audiences. I'd like to get this out uh, to as many people as I can. I've got uh, two other talks at the moment. One's called When Chimps Are Smarter Than People, and Anyone Can Do It, A Beginner's Guide to Science. And both of those, uh, a recorded version like this, are available on my website. And there's a new talk, uh, which I'm developing at the moment, should be ready by about February next year, which is 2023. Um, so there'll be another talk there, which in due course will be available. Uh, if you know anybody who wants to find a speaker and uh, is in a range that I can travel. So that's my website address at the top and my email address down at the bottom there. Um, the website includes references, um, sources where I got all my information from. So you can look into those. Um, but here are, a few, here are a few highlights. 
this is the best book I've ever come across as an introduction to evolution. Uh, it's just brilliant. It's written by Neil Shubin. Terrific, terrific book. Uh, if you're a skeptic, if you don't believe in evolution, or if you know some people who don't believe in evolution, uh, you should take a look at Jerry Coyne. Uh, he explains why it's true, and he looks at some of the objections raised to the theory and explains why they don't actually apply. Uh, David Attenborough's First Life is a lovely book about those early forms of life before the Cambrian explosion, um, the earliest forms of life before things really started to take off. And if you fancy a bit of light relief, uh, you could look this one up, uh, Star Trek. So we've got Star Trek, we've got dinosaurs, we've got the asteroid impact, we've got the whole lot in there. Um, so that's definitely worth doing. And that's my uh, talk. So. Hope you enjoyed it and uh, hope maybe to hear from you.